Hello everyone, my name is Ned Dimitrov and today I'll tell you about interdicting smuggled nuclear material and this is joint work with David Morton at the University of Texas at Austin. So let's begin by setting up the basic problem. Imagine that we're given a transportation network along with a set of origin points represented here in red and a set of destination points represented here in black. And a smuggler would like to take some nuclear material from one of the origin points to one of the destination points. Now as the smuggler travels through the transportation network, along each edge there's some probability that he'll get detected by a local law enforcement. So we call that the indigenous detection probabilities. And the transportation network that we're given comes along with this data that for each edge what is the detection probability on that edge. Now what we'd like to do is actually capture the smuggler with an even higher probability than these indigenous detection probabilities. And to do that what we're allowed to do is place nuclear detectors on border crossings. So for example, we've placed one nuclear detector at this blue dot right here. So a natural question to ask is on which border crossing should we place a limited number of uh, detectors because we only have a limited amount of funding to buy such detectors. This problem has been studied for a number of years, going back at least to a paper of Pan Charlton and Morton in 2003. And uh, of course, exactly which locations you put the nuclear detectors on depends very much on the model of smuggler movement. And there's been a lot of success with a conservative maximum reliability path model, where the smuggler chooses the maximum reliability path from his source to his destination, given knowledge of the detector placement that you've chosen. And the computational success that uh, has been had has been with uh, what are called bipartite networks, and bipartite in this context means that the smuggler crosses at most one border crossing from uh, each of the origins to each of the destinations, as is the case in the picture here. And what we'll do in today's talk is we'll add further realism to modeling this problem. In particular, uh, models are already known where the smuggler chooses a single path from the source to the destination. But in today's talk, we'll let the smuggler choose a probability distribution on paths from the source to the destination. In particular, we'll see that uh, to solve this new model, uh, the key will be to look at the problem from the point of view of distributional uncertainty. So here's a basic outline of the rest of the talk. The first thing that we'll do is simplify the problem to a small example that we can carry through the rest of the conversation. Then we'll introduce the new movement model for the smugglers. We'll formulate the detector placement model, and then we'll iteratively improve our formulation until we get to something efficient. So let's begin by swapping all of that transportation network terminology for something much simpler. So what we're going to do is substitute the transportation network for a grid, the smuggler for a mouse, destination for a piece of cheese on the grid, and the border cells are going to be represented by these blue cells right here. And for the rest of the talk we're going to focus on that bipartite setting where the mouse can cross at most one border from his source to his destination. So let's review the existing model of movement. So in the existing model, when the mouse picks a direction, the mouse moves in that direction with certainty. And the mouse's routing problem, once we've placed some mouse traps over here, is basically a shortest path problem. So the mouse just solves the shortest path from his source to uh, his destination, avoiding the mouse traps if he can. In the new model, when the mouse picks a direction of movement, he's not going to move in that direction with certainty. Instead, he moves in that direction with a probability 1 minus alpha for some bump parameter alpha, and otherwise he's randomly bumped in one of the other three directions, for example up, back, and down, uh, with the remaining probability alpha. So what this models is that when the smuggler is moving along his path, let's say from city A to city B, there could be some unforeseen circumstances. For example, there's a roadblock, or he sees the police, or he gets scared, and so instead of taking that optimal path, what he does is uh, he takes a random other path um, out of the city. So that's uh, represented by these bumps. And now the routing problem for the smuggler, given a particular placement of detectors, is a Markov decision process. So let's review Markov decision processes and how one could go about solving them. So the thing that you need to define a Markov decision process is the following. First, we need a set of states. In our example here, we're going to have one state for each one of the grid's cells in the grid. We need a set of actions for each state. So the set of actions here are going to be go left, right, up, or down. 
We need an initial distribution, which basically specifies the initial location of the smuggler. So basically one for this state and zero everywhere else. We need transition probabilities that basically uh, decide what's the probability distribution on the next state given the current state and the action chosen. So this is basically what's going to capture those bump probabilities that we talked about. And finally, we need to encode the destination somehow. So where's the location of the cheese? And the way that you do that is uh, by having a reward value for each state and action pair. So here we're going to get a reward of 1 if you're at the cheese and 0 everywhere else. And the goal is for the smuggler or for the mouse to choose actions that maximize the expected reward. So he wants to choose for each one of these cells in what direction to go to maximize the probability of getting to this cheese uh, before he gets uh, either detected by the um, detectors that we've placed or by the indigenous detection probabilities. So one way to solve Markov decision processes is with a linear program. And I'm not going to say very much about this except a couple of things. So first, I want to uh, emphasize the decision variables here. We have one decision variable for each state and action pair. And you can interpret these as the expected number of times the mouse performs action A in state S. And then if we look at the objective here, it's, this is the reward that you get for doing action A in state S. This is the expected number of times you do action A in state S. And when you sum that over all states and actions, you get the expected reward. So this is exactly what we said in the previous slide, that the mouse is trying to maximize his expected reward. So that completes uh, the simple example and the new movement model. So let's go about formulating the detector placement model on top of the uh, smuggler movement. So here we're going to take the LP for the mouse's Markov decision process. And on top of it, we're going to add our design decision. So we're going to have these design variable Zs. We're going to have one for each of the blue states. And uh, they're going to be 0 or 1, meaning uh, whether we've placed the detector there or not. And of course, we're going to have a budget constraint on all disease that says that we only have a limited number of detectors to place. Now, the way that we hook up our uh, detector placement choice with the mouse's movement choice is with these inequalities over here. So these inequalities make sure that uh, if we've placed a detector in a particular state, then the mouse is not allowed to use that action. So that forces the expected number of times that the mouse uses that action to be zero. And M is some very big number, so that if we don't place a detector, the mouse is free to use that action as much as he chooses. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of simplify this a little bit by just saying Z is in ZB, and the little B here is just to remind us that there's a budget constraint in there that says that we have a limited number of detectors. Okay, so great. We have our first formulation of the detector placement problem. So how does this formulation do? Well, the first thing that you should notice is that we can't plug this into a standard solver. The reason for that is that we have a min and a max, and most standard solvers just take a min problem or just a max problem. So you might think, okay, well then let's take the dual of the inner problem and we'll have a min-min, but then you'll quickly find out that the resulting uh, problem is not convex in Z. So uh, this formulation doesn't get us very far. So what's the next thing we might do? Well, the next thing we might do is uh, perhaps take this constraint and do a Lagrangian relaxation on it. So in this way, what we're doing is we're basically giving the mouse a huge penalty if he uses an action that he's not, a, in fact, allowed to use. So here, if we've placed a detector in a particular state and the mouse uses an action in that state, then he gets a huge penalty for that. And uh, that is basically going to stop the mouse from uh, using actions that he's not allowed to use. So what about this problem? So it turns, that, uh, turns out that now when you take the dual of the inner problem, you do get a mixed integer linear program that you can stick into a standard solver. However, this has an extremely poor LP relaxation, and so it, you get very, very bad performance when you stuck it into a solver. So uh, what's another uh, thing that we could do to further improve our formulation? Let's just take this inner maximization problem and uh, call the value of the problem h of z. So it's a function of z because it depends on our placement of uh, the detectors. And let's rewrite everything like this. We'll say uh, that this problem is just minimize over z and theta. Theta has to be bigger than or equal to that inner problem's value, and z is in zb. So um, let's 
think about how to calculate the inner problems value in a different way. So what we're going to do is basically list all of the probability distribution on paths that the mouse can choose from his source to his destination. And uh, each of those distribution gives us a probability that the mouse can get to the cheese given our particular placement plan Z. So another way to say theta is bigger than or equal to H of Z is to say that theta is bigger than or equal to the probability that the mouse gets to the cheese under our choice of placement Z under every distribution D that the mouse is allowed to choose. But uh, this isn't a very good formula. We don't really have a formula for this. So let's try to do that a bit more explicitly. So we want theta to be bigger than or equal to uh, the probability that the mouse gets to the cheese under uh, his chosen path distribution D and given our detector placement Z. So one way to rewrite this is uh, sum over all paths from the source to the destination of the indicator whether the path is available under our placement Z. So paths that go through detectors are not available and paths that don't go through detectors are available. And then the mouse's probability distribution assigns some probability to that particular path, uh, capital P. So we're almost there, except uh, these indicator functions aren't very good. We can't stick them into a standard solver very easily. So let's instead introduce some binary variables Y that are going to account for these indicator functions. So uh, how do we do this? Uh, we're going to have one indicator variable for each of the paths, and the indicator variable is going to uh, be computed like this. It's going to be bigger than or equal to 1 minus the sum over all states that could have a detector on, on them uh, that are also on the path of the z variable for that state. So in other words, if we have at least one detector uh, on the path, then the y variable can be 0. Otherwise, all of these z's are 0, and we're forcing the y variable to be 1. Uh, which forces the indicator here to be 1 and pushes up the lower bound of uh, theta. So now we can go back to our formulation and plug all of that in. We have theta is bigger than or equal to the sum over paths of the y variables, the probability distribution of the particular path, and uh, this inequality is for all choices that the mouse has. Uh, over here we have our indicator y variables and z and zb and of course our y variables are also binary. So this is the point at which uh, you can think of this problem as a probability distribution uncertainty problem. So here we're uncertain again uh, at what probability distribution we're facing. Okay so great this is a nice formulation we can stick it into a standard solver except for the following problems. Uh, the problem is that this has very, very large size. First of all, there are many, many paths from sources to destination, and there's many, many probability distributions that the mouse can choose. But of course, whenever we have such an exponentially sized problem, the standard thing you could do is you could try doing row generation on the problem. So let's see how we can do that in our particular instance. So here we are. We're going to start with a master problem that doesn't involve any of those exponential uh, inequalities. And uh, what we're going to do is solve that master problem to get a particular detector placement Z. Now, under that detector placement, we're going to solve the Markov decision process to get a probability distribution paths, uh, a probability distribution on paths D that the mouse chooses. Then we can sample a paths from that probability distribution. And then for each of the sample paths, we can add the following to our master. We're going to add the Y variable for that path to see if it's covered or not and then we're going to add the lower bound for uh, theta that comes from the paths that we have sampled. Uh, so great, we have this loop and uh, how do we know when to stop this loop? Well one stopping condition is uh, when we have a very close lower and upper bounds. So every time we solve the master problem we get a lower bound or an underestimate on the probability and this is because we're being optimistic. We haven't included all of the mouse's responses, all of the mouse's paths that he can choose. That's why that gives a lower bound. And every time we solve the MDP, we get an upper bound. And the reason for that is because we have a particular detector placement and a particular uh, best response for the mouse that uh, gives us uh, the upper bound on our objective function value. So when these two are close, we can stop. But another important stopping criterion is uh, when we get a fixed point. In other words, if we ever get the same plan Z that comes out of step one, then we know we can stop. And the reason for that 
is because the second time that a particular z comes out of step one, we know we've already accounted for it. We've already found the best response to that. We've already sampled paths from that. And so it's already accounted for, and there's no need to continue. So uh, this is an important stopping criterion, and it'll come up again uh, later in the talk. So if you just do the sampling as we've described, you'll see that once again it has poor performance. And the reason for that is that sampling can be very misleading. So let's see why that is through this simple example. So here the mouse has chosen the following probability distribution. He goes left with probability 10%, right 90% of the time. Then if he goes left, he keeps going this way and this way with probability 1. And if uh, he goes right, then he can take any one of these 1 million paths, each with a probability 1 over 1 million, and then uh, to get to this uh, blue node over here, Z2, and then to get to the cheese with probability 1 after that. So you can see that if we sample paths, then 10% of the time we're going to get this node Z1. And then 90% uh, of the time we're going to get one of these paths that has a tiny, tiny probability. Uh, so what sampling does is it's not really able to account for these many, many low probability paths that all go through the state Z2. So how might, might we go about solving this uh, problem that sampling can be misleading? Well, the solution is that we can group all of the paths that go through exactly one of the blue states. So the way to do this is we're going to add a single y variable that uh, accounts for the entire group of paths that go through this particular blue state, either z1 or z2. And we're going to just in one go calculate the probability that any path in the group is taken. We're going to calculate the probability that the mouse uh, takes any path from his start to his destination that only goes through this one state, z2. Uh, and the way that you can do this is fairly straightforward. Uh, what you can do is basically leave only one blue state open, so we can cover this one, only leave this one open, and then uh, solve a linear system to get the probability that the mouse gets to the cheese. So mathematically, what this grouping is doing is the following. Originally, we had uh, a lower bound that looked like this. It was the sum over all paths from the origin to the cheese an indicator for the path and the probability that we take that path. Now we're going to take that sum and split it up into two groups. So in the first group what we're going to have is a sum uh, that is over all of the blue states. We're going to have just one indicator variable that says is that blue state available or not. And then over here we're going to have the probability that any path going through only that blue state S is taken. And then uh, the rest of the paths that go through more than one blue state we're going to keep as before, and these are going to be handled by the sampling as before. So uh, let's see computational results for our final and uh, most efficient formulation. So we're going to see a couple of these graphs, so let me tell you how to read them. The mouse starts up here on the right, and he's trying to get to the cheese down here on the left. Uh, these are, again, the uh, border crossings or the places where we can put detectors. So here's one example of going from the corner to the corner. You can see that uh, this solution makes a lot of sense. The reason that we've spread out the detectors like this is because we're hoping that if the mouse takes one of these paths, he basically gets bumped randomly into one of our detectors and uh, he'll get caught that way. And this particular example is very computationally intensive. And the reason for that is because all of these paths are just equally good for the mouse because he's basically just doing a taxicab distance from his source to his destination. So let's look at a slightly different example. Here we have three possible cheeses that the mouse could get to, one here, one here, and one here. And again, the solution seems like it makes sense. We spent a bunch of detectors to basically block off this cheese from the mouse. The reason for that is because this cheese is very close and so uh, the mouse wouldn't get caught by the indigenous detection probabilities if he goes this way. We've spent some more detectors to try to block off the mouse from this cheese, which forces the mouse to mostly go around uh, to the third cheese, but sometimes he gets bumped and he decides to go to this uh, middle cheese as well. So what about the computational complexity of solving such problems? So here's uh, the three cheese example, and what we've done is we've varied the grid size uh, from 10 to 80, and this is the number of master subproblem iterations that we have to do before we stop. And you can see that this basically grows linearly uh, in the grid size. Of course, the complexity here is not growing linearly, it's growing polynomially because we have to solve a bunch of linear systems 
uh, with of basically this size squared um, to base to get the transition probabilities for all of those groups of paths. Uh, and for this calculation, what we did was we set the budget to be half of the available position. So we're really trying to get the most intense situation that we could. So here's a performance of the several algorithms that we ta uh, talked about. So here you can see uh, the performance of the lower and upper bounds when we did the path grouping uh, versus the iteration number uh, of the master subproblem. So you can see in not many iteration, we get the upper and lower bounds to be pretty tight. But if you don't do path grouping, if you just do path sampling, then the lower and upper bounds don't get close almost at all, as represented here by the uh, red lines. And if you look at the, in the black lines, what we did was we cranked up the path sampling from 1,000 paths to 100,000 paths. So these black lines took were 100 times slower to produce than these red lines, but still uh, they didn't get nearly as good as uh, our path grouping lines, which are considerably faster than sampling 100,000 paths. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is that the lower and upper bounds for the path grouping never really touched. And the reason for this is because we're using here that second stopping criterion, the fixed point stopping criterion, because the same uh, plan of detector placement came out of the master problem twice in a row. So here are some future directions for working with this problem. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to apply our results to the original network which we saw at the beginning of the talk, the Los Alamos Transportation Network. Uh, the next plan is to combine the path generation approach that we talked about with the original MILP formulation that I told you about, which had very poor performance. And the reason for this is because the path generation can actually give you optimality cuts for the MILP. So when you combine them, you get guaranteed optimality and good performance. And finally, what we'd really like to do is study uh, the sensitivity of the detector placement to this bump parameter alpha that we had. So uh, if alpha is equal to zero, if the mouse never gets bumped, then you basically get back the original maximum reliability conservative path model that I introduced at the beginning of the talk. However, if alpha is equal to one, then basically what you get is a random walk. Uh, the mouse always gets randomly bumped and so he's randomly walking through the graph from his source to his destination. And the question is how do the detector placements depend on this parameter alpha? Thank you very much for listening.